Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. and locally administered by the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio and administered by Brian Powers who happens to be our cameraman today. Today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a World War II veteran Robert Lewis Bork, and today's date, incidentally, is the 24th of July, 2019, and we're at Mr. Bork's home in Burlington, Kentucky. And Mr. Bork, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. And Glad to meet you. Is it okay to call you Bob or Robert? Right, Bob. Bob? Well, if you would, Bob, uh, tell us your date of birth and where you were born. October the 4th, 1925, in Cincinnati, Ohio. What, do you remember where you were living then at that time? Uh, <laughs> uh, I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, on, at 503 Broadway Street. Downtown. Right. I see. And what were your parents' names, Bob? Frank, and my mother's name was Catherine with a C. And uh, your mother's maiden name? Johnson. Johnson. And um, what kind of work did your dad do? Uh, he drove a, tr drove a truck. In fact, he was, he was delivering Sunday morning inquiries, and I was born upstairs, and they got, when he got Back, they said, you got a birthday present. <laughs> uh, and uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? Uh, yeah, I had uh, I had I had two half sisters, but then I had a sister, and then I had two brothers. I see. And did your mother work outside of the home, or was she a housewife? No, she, at those days, she stayed at home. Uh huh. And uh, do you recall who your grandparents on your dad's side? Uh, not too well, but uh, nat naturally he was he was William Bork, and he lived over. Uh, on the, on the north side of Norwood. I see. And what about your mother's parents? Do you recall them? Uh, he was... Uh, His name, too, they are. Yeah. Well, he was... Uh, her first husband died of the flu, and he... In World War One, and eventually she met my father. I see. And uh, what schools did you go to as a boy? I went to uh, St. Matthew's and then I went to Norwood High School. I see. And. Uh, did you do any sports while you were in high school? Uh, yeah, yeah, I played baseball. What position did you play? Shortstop. Shortstop. Did you graduate from Norwood High? Yes, I did. You, what year did you graduate? 1944. 1944. He was offered a professional contract for baseball. Oh, your son Bill uh, just told me that you were offered a, a professional contract. Yes, but the World War, World War II stopped that because when I come out, I hurt my arm. What was who had offered you the contract, though? Uh, I was offered by uh, who the heck was it?
I think it was the old Philadelphia Athletics. I see. <laughs> you know, I forgot forgot that so much. Uh huh. At um, how did you hurt your arm? I was just the day the day I come out. I started to try out for the team where I was trying out whatever the team. And I picked the ball up and I threw it and I heard it snap and I picked up my glove and a hat and the guy that was trying, trying us out, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm through. I knew my arm was gone. Wow, what timing. Please? What timing that was. Yes. <laughs> At, uh, as, um, I'd like to see if, uh, if you recall uh, Pearl Harbor Day, uh, where you were at and how you heard about it. I was Pearl Harbor, I was up in North College, you know, at, uh, getting in, inducted into the, what the heck was it? Anyway, <clears throat> and we come home and the guy that rode me up there lived, lived up on uh, Dacey Avenue and he dropped me off at, down at that five, five point and I just walked up. I didn't know what the hell was going on, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't imagine a lot of people did. Were you still living on Broadway when uh, Pearl Harbor Day was? Oh no, Norwood. In Norwood? We're at in Norwood. Catherine Avenue. Catherine Avenue. We just had dinner the other night at Sorrento's in Norwood. Oh, did you? Yeah. Do you recall that place as a youngster? Well, where was it? Uh, I thought it was on Reading Road down near uh, the downtown area. No. It was an Italian restaurant. It's still there. I don't know. Uh-huh. So after high school, um, when you graduated in 1944, what did you do? Uh, you graduated in June, I assume. <laughs> yeah. That's I, uh, I, uh, started law school at the old Chase YMCA downtown, and oh, then, yeah. and then uh, I heard I was taking the exam, for what the heck they call it. Anyway, there were 3,000 people took the exam, and I, I was one of them, and I won out. To be a law student there? Or? No, I, uh, that was to take a civil service job. Oh. And I, I had remembered the jobs were hard to get during the, before the war, and I was thinking about. It. So then I took the, po the post office job. And I was there for 55 years. That was after the war. Yeah. Um, did you get drafted into World War II or did you join? Oh, no. No, I, uh, I got drafted. And uh, I walked up uh, to the library in Norwood got on a bus, bus took us over to the old uh, Pennsylvania Railroad, up, up we went to Columbus, Columbus we come back through Cincinnati, I thought, oh God, and then uh, I ended up in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, and from Bloomington, 
Where did I go? That was August of 44 when you joined the Army then. <laughs> that's the one way of putting as it. You, as you, yeah, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> well, you were inducted into the Army. That's right, not better. right. Okay. And what did, what, what did they have at Bloomington, Indiana? Uh, I, was it basic uh, training or anything? Or? That, that was an old Army camp. That was still there when I come back from overseas. And uh, we got off of Newport News, little old troop ship. I had a, somebody said something, I said, I, just give me canoe, because I got on in Marseille. And the day we got on Marseille, I was halfway up the anchor. <laughs> and somebody said, they dropped an atom bomb. I said, what the hell is an atom bomb? I didn't know, neither did the rest of the country. <laughs> anyway, I said, uh, guy said, give me a canoe and a paddle. I'll paddle my way home. And we got off in the Newport News. And the band was playing. And when I got off, I had my duffel bag, naturally, and I kissed the ground. Newport News. That's how glad I, even though I was younger, that's how glad I was to, to be home. Um, from Bloomington, though, where did you go? Did you go to Fort Knox, for example? I yes. Think, uh, and what, why did they, what, did you, what were you doing at Fort Knox? Were you, were you, I don't, I don't know. Well, that was basic training, so to speak, mm -hmm. and that's that's where I learned to to drive tanks. What kind of what type of tank was it that you learned on down there? That was the old. Uh, was that a Sheridan or? Yeah. We saw that old one they had before the war, and it was. They made it with rivets, and they found out the rivets flew out when the, it got hit. And so they stopped doing that, so, so it's a... Uh, Did you train on uh, Sherman while you were at Fort Knox? Yes. I trained on the, the old light tank, too. And what uh, were you assigned to an outfit while you were down there at? Uh... Oh no, no. When I got overseas, I was. We went up to. <laughs> Somehow I ended up. At eighty eighty one. Eighty first tank battalion. Yes. The company A I have there. Right, part of the Fifth Armored Division. Right. When you went overseas, where did you leave from? Over New York or New Jersey? Uh, oh, or? New York. I left. I went over on the Queen Mary, and I was. I was on the submarine mobile, lost for the Queen Mary, and then when I got over there. It docked in somewhere in, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Always a big place. <laughs> and I, when the guy said, uh, uh, about submarines, and see, I was on the submarine watch going overseas. Naturally, I never seen any submarines. <laughs> I said, "Oh, I said I seen one of those over there." I was just kidding him, of course. The English guy—they did—they took things serious, <laughs> and I learned quick, quick like you could pull their leg easy. 
So you, so you landed in Scotland after right. being part of a convoy then on the Queen Mary. Queen Mary went by itself. Oh, it did? No convoy. Wow. The Queen Mary went all by itself. We went all the way down to Florida the first day, and the next day, we were, it was so damn cold. You, you know, you had to wear everything you had to be up on that bridge, because mm -hmm. they were four hours at a clip. And uh, we could look in the wheelhouse and everything else. And when, he, when I come down one morning, we were only on there about four or five days. And when we come down, I asked my lieutenant, who was in charge of us, I said, I would like to have a hot cup of coffee. He said, I'll make a phone call and you go down to the galley. Well, that galley was the full length of that ship. Guess what? What? I got hot tea. <laughs> hot tea. That about, that about went over well, too. Mm -hmm. uh, after you landed in Scotland, where did you go? Scotland, we went, got on a damn train and went down to Southampton, Southampton over to France and up the hill. And now when you went uh, over to France, uh, did you get off at like Omaha Beach or somewhere? Like yes. That? Yes, we did. And were you uh, driving a tank then? No. No, I didn't get get to 81 for, for a couple of weeks, I guess. And what do you mean by 81? I mean... The what? 81st tank battalion. Right. Oh. 81st of the 5th. Oh, yeah. You, you hadn't been assigned to the 81st yet. Oh, no. no, no. After you hit the beach area at Omaha, how long did it was it before you were assigned to the 81st? Well, you fiddled or faddled around. And it's about two weeks, I guess. About two weeks. Now, while well, you were trained to be a driver of a tank while you were at Fort Knox. Yes. How many men were on a tank? There were five men, but when we, the 200, over 200 guys trained to be tank drivers. 210 passed. And you're looking at one of them. <laughs> you know, I, I drove an old, you know, clutch clutch car. And I never did. The guy said, "Double clutch." I said, "Double clutch." I thought, "My God!" And all, uh, there were a lot of our uh, farming guys that took that exam. But only 210 of us passed. Out of how many? Out of how many? Out of 200. Oh, geez, I don't know how much. It's over 210. You know, we don't often hear about the, the operation of a tank. Uh, what, and it was it like a standard shift in a car? No. Laterals. I guess. You would, you would see them in a, in a, out, out on a, out a farm, but then you had laterals, and then you had the, the clutch inside, and then uh, you would double clutch it at times. 
But then sometimes you <laughs> sometimes you get the hell out of there. You know? Pretty hot inside that tank, wasn't it? Yes, it was hot. It was hot. And you had four other men inside the tank with you? Yes. What were their jobs, Bob? Uh, well, one naturally was the assistant gunner. Well, the transmission was right next to me here. I, I got the over here. And then there was a transmission, and then the assistant driver, and the assistant driver had a 30 caliber machine gun. And then, of course, there was a tank commander. And then there was the, the gun loader, and then the loader. And then the, the, he fired the gun. What caliber did they fire, the Sherman? Now, you're driving the Sherman, right? Right. Well, they were. They fired. Was it uh, 76, uh, 76 millimeter shell? No, it was. It was a 75. 75? Right. That tells you how much I know about it. Right. 75. Uh, how often did the, your tank fire the, their shells? Well, as often as needed, but not too often. They would, they would holler down, get the hell out of here, and I got the hell out of there. I never asked questions. You know? I shoved that clutch in it, and away I went. How many forward gears did a Sherman have? Sherman, he's at home for, I would say five gears, probably more. I've, for, I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. Do you remember uh, what towns you went through? Oh, jeez. Went through, uh, I joined them mostly up in the, beyond uh, uh, Were you near St. Lowe? No, I was above that. Okay. And then we were mostly up up past uh, after the bulge, and we went on up there, and and uh, the day Roosevelt died. Right. That was April the twelfth of forty-five. Thirteen. I'll tell you why. Because of the time zone. I was, we were driving on the Autobahn. And they come back from, they had the BBC on, on the radio, the English had it, and they said, Roosevelt died. And I said, who's president? And they said, Who the heck was it? Harry Truman. Truman. I said, who's Truman? Who am I supposed to know? Right. And then that day, I took 130 gallons of high pressure gas in that tank. 130 gallons. And then we went, we went on up there, and the crowds, their little old railroad bridges or whatever they called them, on the automobile, they had knocked them out, 
But then we just went down this side, up the other side, and they had a, they had a, we had a new road. Did you have to cross any rivers? Yes. I don't know which river there was. It, I had to. Uh, I don't know. I used to know the name of it, but I don't mm -hmm. anymore. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you crossed the Rhine. Well, I. <coughs> I crossed the Rhine. Excuse me. On the way home. On the way home. <laughs> if they had given me a paddle, I had a paddle to cross. That's a long, that's a wide piece of river. Yes. But it was, the old bridge was still out, and they were putting a, a wooden bridge in. And that's the one I come back across it, but I I wouldn't care. Let me get me out of here. Do you ever have occasion to uh, capture any Germans yourself or your yes. captain? Yes. Yes. Tell us about that. They uh, the guy. See, they had Italian war prisoners, and they used the slave labor. And I was, I was on the, uh, my tank was on the, what the hell, roadblock. And the guy come over and he said, there's Germans out there. And they, they were in the old, uh, Where the cows used to go. The old barn, milk barn? No. Or, or? It was cement. And there was one hole there, one hole there. And the guy with me, I, I said, I'm going to go out there. He said, I'm not going. Well, luckily, there was a guy from the infantry was up there on a the hill. He said, where are you going? I said, I hear it's a bunch of crouch. I went in one door. He went in the other door. We had, I got five Lugers out of that. But they were all officers. Uh, they, they weren't regular soldiers. But I took them, put them in, put them in a, with, a, with a truck and sent them, sent them off to the prison job pile. But I get the five of, I get those leaders to the officers. I shouldn't have done it, really. They didn't appreciate what they had, you know. Yeah. There was an instance where there was that German prisoner, Bob, that was Making fun of you? Yeah. How was he making fun of you? Well, you know, doing things and I made him shut up. Don't ask me how I made him shut up. All right. There, there were women behind him, German women behind him, and he was doing something and making them laugh. Mm -hmm. Doing it from behind his back or something. Oh. And tell, tell, no, tell him what you t made him do, Bob. What was that? I go, you, ma you made him crawl? Oh, yeah. I made him crawl. And he, he thought he, he said he was going to Buffalo, that he had a relation in Buffalo. But he, I made him get down and see, we were in the farming country. And naturally, 
you know what was on the ground. My tank wasn't, my tank sat on the side. I made him cut down and crawl through it. Right through the cow manure. And the rest, when I put him with, with the other prisoners, the other prisoners dodged it. And he was an officer because he was a, uh, a doctor. And what got me as he had tested kids in Russia. And he had, I guess he had drag because he, he was, he was, he was coming this way. But <laughs> they, they dodged him like nothing. And then when I, I, the guy come, the prison truck, They were big truck, and we loaded them in there, and actually the guys were in there to guard them, and I said, and when I put him inside, made sure he was the last one, and I told the driver, Ruski, me in Russia, and actually, I didn't know where the hell they were going. But I he heard you say that. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. He and he knew enough English. <laughs> he he thought you were sending him to Russia, huh? Right. <laughs> he didn't want any part of that. You right. mentioned the bridge earlier. Uh huh. There was a, a situation where he had to cross a bridge with tank. There was a new tank that came in that he had driven. Right. The new way. New 81, what was the he went? And they couldn't, they couldn't get, they couldn't get that tank across the bridge. Because of the wideness of the tracks or yeah, what? Yeah. The old tanks, no problem to get to the other side. So they, I drove the tank over there to the other side, and the sides were just hanging off of there. One little, one little move, and I would have been in the water. But I got it over there. So, but what happened? You heard a splash, right? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, they, somebody fell in the water. There was a guy in front that he, he couldn't get away. He jumped off the bridge. An American? Yeah, he was yeah. standing on the bridge and he didn't realize the tank was so wide and he waited too long to right. jump in the water. <laughs> Had to get the hell out of there. Uh, before we go on any further, I want to show a picture to um, the viewers. And this is you standing in front of a is that a Sherman tank? A11? Yeah. Yeah. What does A11 mean, stand for? No, that was just the, the company. Your company? Right. Do you, what was the name of the tank? They had a, that's me. That's you, right? They, they just, they just, they didn't give a name to a tank. I, it was A something. It says, it says A11 there. Right. That was part of it. But you said your commander named the tank. Arkansas something? Oh, yeah. I've long since forgotten that. What, Arkansas what? Traveler? Could be. You told me a while back, the Arkansas Traveler. Right. Uh -huh. Do you recall these fellows standing next to you in front of that tank? I do not. Were they your tank crew members? Well, one was the tank commander, and 
one was the tank uh, gunner, and one was the tank loader, and the one guy, we don't know what the hell happened to him. He was the, he was the gunner, and we don't know. We had to send him back to to the uh, rear. Yeah, never did see him again. He had a problem of some sort. Yeah, he had a problem. <laughs> kind of a. What would you say? Uh, he didn't want to be there. Okay. Okay. And actually, uh, it was kind of towards the end anyway. And we did, we never we never did replace him. You also mentioned Bob that um, you were pouring gas into the tank. Yeah. And. Uh, had, had an explosion? Yeah. It just, just went boom. Uh, that's what messed up your right eye? Yeah. And they never did take care of it. Never, huh? Never have, no. Well, we still got time to get them. Huh? We still got time to get them. Oh. <laughs> I don't want no more part of them. Yeah. Uh, I somehow remember something about a Bleicheroda. Bleich right. Is that how you pronounce it, Bleicheroda? Right. What is that? That was a little town and uh, we were on our way out of Germany. And that's, that's a little town and some kraut he, he had on liquors and oh boy, he was dressed in a, a, a jacket. <coughs> and we'd go down and guard him, or guard whoever was there. And we were sending the surface to aim, air missiles back to Paris before the Germans would let the Germans come into that town. And <coughs> it was bad. So the Germans had service to air missile, missiles there, huh? They did, but we didn't let them get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, <laughs> the guy said, you have a cigarette? I said, no, nine, nix. <coughs> and the guy says, he wanted a cigarette. Mm -hmm. I never did, uh, never had smoked. <coughs> but was in, in France, we had a third class car. We got on a, up of Germany somewhere <coughs> and there weren't too many of us. <coughs> the commode, we shut the commode down because you know it was full of you know what. Because it was uh, full of Germany, you know, but the Germans were using it. But then when we, I got over to France, some guy got on in France and he said, uh, I'll offer you $28 for a cart of cigarettes. And I turned to him and I said, If I, I'm not going to sell you a carton of cigarettes, 
And if I have a son and you don't keep this peace, I'm not going to let my son come over here. And I sincerely believed it. And I told him, I said, and I'm not coming back over here. And I sincerely believed it. Bob, would you like a drink? Want a drink, uh, Bob? mentioned, um, Bob, that there was a barn that you came up on at one time. Mm-hmm. What was, what was that? What was that? Yeah. A barn? <clears throat> yeah, you said that some of the soldiers were put inside and it was burned. Yeah. I don't know. You, you've seen a lot of junk. You've seen a lot of junk. But you said that you found a bunch of uh, dog tags inside that barn. Oh, yeah. You just turned the dog tags in. And you said it, it was obvious that some of them had tried to get out of the barn, that they had burned it with them in it? The Germans and oh. the SS troops? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, naturally, they probably tried to get out. But we got there too late. It just, the crowds were crazy. Did you, uh, you said that, didn't you make them bury the bodies or something? The town people, you made them come in? Right. We made them come in and, and bury them in individual graves and before we left. And then you had told me once that the town people didn't believe it happened. Yeah, oh yeah. Naturally they wouldn't believe it happened. They wouldn't, they wouldn't believe anything the Germans did was bad. Mm -hmm. That's how crazy the French were. How is that, how's that related to the French? That they believed the Germans? Right, they believed the Germans rather than what we told them, but then we told them, bury them. Oh, okay. It's crazy, crazy, war is crazy. Mm -hmm. He did say he crossed, they were one of the first units to cross the Elbe. Right, we crossed the Elbe, and we had crossed the Elbe, And the, the Russians had already crossed the Elbe and they were ready to attack Berlin. And Eisenhower told us, come back across the Elbe and come on home. And we were too damn glad to do it because we were actually in, over in facing, I guess, Berlin. Yes. That's, uh, Have you ever stayed in touch with anybody that you were in the service with or your tank battalion? No. You never went to any reunions or anything? No. I was just When I come home and I walk down 6th Street <coughs> and I had, had everything off just by, by my pants because we never had clothes and I, I was glad that I didn't have to wear that uniform. When you, uh, when you left uh, Europe, did you leave out of France? No, I left out of Marseille. 
on Mar What were you doing down at Marseille? Well, they, we were on the damn train, and then, <clears throat> and then of course, uh, the war was over, and then they, they kept pouring guys in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then, uh, <clears throat> We had a little old troop ship, about 6,000 guys, that we got on. I told you that we said, what's an atom bomb? But That's when you heard about the atom bomb, yeah. And then I looked over in, Mar in Marseille. It was, it was kind of eerie because these, these were big tankers were laying on our side because somebody had bombed them, I guess. And that was August of 45, and you were down at Marseille. Right. At, uh, did, and did you leave from Marseille to come home? Yes. I'd come from Marseille, Newport News. Newport News up to that little place in Indiana. I said, Fort Benjamin Harrison? I don't know what it was at that time. That was, Fort Benjamin Harrison was the first time. Oh. The second time, and. Is that where you were discharged at? Uh, no, I, they sent me down to uh, Texas. Camp Brownwood, Texas, and they sent me up to the hospital. And the guy, I spent six weeks getting treated for years, you know, and the doctor finally said, you're going to get discharged then. Of course, I was still young. And I said, oh, he said, yeah. And I said, you should have never been in the Army, son, let alone overseas, because of the conditions of my ears. Now was a hell of a time to tell me. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's what I told him. But then I... And then I, the camp, uh, oh, was he? He took care of the bands. You know, that was a soft job. And <clears throat> And he said, I'm going to go over and get my teeth checked. I said, I get home, I'll get my teeth checked at a private doctor. Anyway, the next day I seen him. And he said, the, uh, guy was fooling around with the with the nurse the dentist you know was fooling around and he drilled a hole through his good tooth and he had to pull the damn thing and I laughed like hell I said you got just what you deserve <laughs> okay okay um. So where were you at when you were discharged? Down in Texas. At Texas. Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I show you were discharged on the 6th of February, 1946. Yes, when uh, the, rest, the other guys 
But then uh, a lieutenant came with, a, with the old ambulance. He had an ambulance. The old ambulance? Yeah. And he said, uh, he gave me my money. And then he gave me my discharge. And he said, there you are, sir. There you are, sir. And I thought, yeah. But the minute I, minute I got in that little town, I took the money and sent it home by Western Union. You know, what was it, $300 or something? A lot of money at yeah, that time. Yeah, at those times. So how'd you get home? Uh, by train. And then I, I got up in Chicago. They had, I don't know if you know anything about it. They had four train stations. Anyway, I had to get a hold of the Pennsylvania, and I got, I got the Pen Pennsylvania out there in old Winton Place. Yeah, I hopped off that train. And I just kissed the ground again. So your mom and dad were glad to see you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you have anything else about the war experiences, Bill? Nothing else that I was checking my notes. I didn't have uh -huh. anything else. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was one thing that um, he had talked about spending time uh, out in the winter a lot. Oh, yeah. And he said he would never go camping again because he spent so no, much time I outside told, in the winter. I told the, uh, oh, when we got off the ship and we had to march up that hill. We had to march up the hill in columns of threes. And I looked over, and this guy on that side was giving his kid a chocolate candy bar. And he, in turn, was handing him a bottle of cognac. The next day, the, the cognac was poison. He died. Is that right? He never, yeah. I, I said, he got just what he deserved. In a way, and I said, although I hated to see it, but they, they talked about, you know, the, the Frenchman, but he handed him a bottle of poison cognac. And that's a true story. That's terrible. And that was a young French kid that gave him that. Yeah. He was hanging off of a tree, <clears throat> but high enough that he could offer that guy. Some guy, the candy bar and the cognac. Now whether the kid knew the cognac was poison or not, I do not know. Mm. That's one of those terrible things you hear about, and there's no answer. Right. But, uh, well, when you got home, what did you do with yourself? Did you go back to school or did you get a job? Well, I, uh, I went to the YMCA and I invested in law school. You know, we had the GI Bill of Rights, and I enlisted in law school. Chase Law School? Yes. And then like I said, 
then the, then they said they they were to take an exam for civil service for civil service three th and I heard three thousand of us took it and I took it I passed it <coughs> but <laughs> and that's why I ended up fifty five years in the post office by eventually was got to be a supervisor and eventually the the thing that on the bottom of your envelope the barcode right I started that in 1970 and 1974 Cincinnati didn't want it. I said, you're making a big mistake. So in 1980, they brought it back and they said, we want you to take care of this. So I took care of it for... What's a barcode tell you? <coughs> it's just like a, a code, you know, the old zip code. It's a zip code. But it's, it's it's a barcode, you know. Did you have anything to do with developing that? Yes, IBM was the company, and they helped us develop it. And they were the the big big wheels of it. And then they said. Cincinnati didn't want it, huh? No. Well, now it's used on everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you can lay partial claim to it anyway, can't you? Yes, I can. And that's, I can uh, that's remarkable. I can laugh like hell every time I look at it. Ha! <laughs> um, did you continue playing any sports when you were a civilian now that you're back from the war? No. Never played baseball again? No. Huh. Well, not totally true. Because he he played, he, he kind of coached our softball team. Oh. And we, we got him into one of the games. Uh, we did, yeah. I, I played in one of the games. Many years later. Uh -huh. Right. He did good. So, tell us about... Um, your married life and your romantic life. <laughs> well, I got married right after to the girl I was going with. <clears throat> I said, naturally, I didn't know. I said, if I last through this, we'll get married. Which, which I did, and we were married for 32 years. What was her name? Mary Helen. Mary Helen? Yeah. And her maiden name? Williams. Williams? Where was she from? She was originally from Tennessee. Where'd you meet her at? Well, I met her at the old fair store at 6th and Ray Streets. The old what? The old fair store at 6th and Ray Streets. And I was, there was an alley in between there, and I bought an, an ice cream, a soft syrup. I don't know what it was. I said, said here, and she said, she was nice. And then she was staying with a lady. She, she had, left her parent people in Tennessee and she said the lady told me later she said I have met the nicest man you know she talking about you yes <laughs> <laughs> what well, um, 
How long did you all go together before you got married? Oh, I, I guess I time overseas in a couple of months, and then I was married for 30, 32 years. And did you two have any children? No, we, we had one, but I haven't heard from him for years. And then I was, she died. I, I was coming in 6.30 in the morning and I said, I was going to tell her I knew she was in bad shape from cancer. And I, I said, don't take, drive your car. I'm coming back and get you. And when I walked in that door, the bedroom door, mm -hmm. I said, oh my God. That is such a startling effect. I have really never gotten over it. <coughs> and then for, I was, that was in 1950-something. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I met, I didn't really date or anybody else, but then I went to a thing at St. X Church, and I seen this nice little lady. And I said, that's for me. You should. And I was, I was, uh, <coughs> and what was her name? Or is her name, I'm sorry. Well, her husband had died too. And She was dancing with some guy, and I, I went over there to that guy, and I said, out. <laughs> you were big enough to get away with it. Right. Yeah, I was big enough to, if he'd have said something, I mean, you know what I would have done. Yeah. And then the rest is history. And well, what's that pretty little girl's name? What? Huh? What was is that pretty girl's name? What's your name? <laughs> don't be so mean. Don't be so mean. Huh? Yeah. But he wants you to tell him her, her name, Bob. Don't tell him mother's name. Can't really think of it now. That's all right. Millie. Okay. Millie. Marshall. Mi name Millie Marshall. Is that your maiden name, though, Marshall? When, and where are you from, Millie? I'm from Fort Mitchell. Fort Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And what was your mom and dad's name? My mother was Cora Marshall, and my father was Arthur Marshall. My father worked for the the. Um, Company. He was their designer and all kinds of things. He made um, well, patterns. Uh, patterns. Patterns for coffins. Uh -huh. Yeah. And my mother, well, later she became a practical nurse. You know. What hospital did she work for? She worked at um, Christ Hospital, but then she worked at Drake Hospital. Okay. She was in charge of the, the dental clinic. And how long you've been married to this honorary guy over here? <laughs> Since 1984. 1984? Mm -hmm. And how many children did y'all have? Well, we didn't have any, but I had four. Oh, I see. And, uh, and their names? Ellen, Bill, Craig, and Brian. And this is Bill we have here That's with Bill, us. Bill, yeah. And Ellen's a dentist, and 
she has four children, mm -hmm. and then Bill, and then Craig works for Toyota, and he has three children, and his daughter's getting married in another month. And then Brian, he has three, four children, right? And he works for the bank. What, what's the name of that bank? U.S. U.S. Bank. He travels. Uh -huh. And I have three children. Oh, I <laughs> and yeah. I have two grandchildren. One was yeah. just born last Friday. I see. That's wonderful. A boy or She's girl? She's got two great granddaughters. Two great granddaughters. And is that a boy or girl born both, last Friday? Both girls. Both girls? Well, yeah. They're both granddaughters. Yeah. Um, so she's got two great grandkids and they're both mine. Well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they uh, do. And um, Brian, do you have any questions for us? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So you, uh, when did, how old were you when you moved to Norwood? I guess I was about four years old. Okay, so you grew up in Norwood, even though you were born downtown? Oh yeah. And so you were still in high school when Pearl Harbor happened? Yes. And it was a few years before you got drafted, right? So you remember what was kind of going on in Norwood during the war. What were some of the things you remember, like rationing, things like that? What are your, some of your memories about the war effort in, in Norwood? Well, <clears throat> there, were, there, there wasn't. War effort, Grove Wernicke and American Laundry and Cincinnati playing card? My U.S. playing card. Or U.S. playing card, yeah. Um, who was, who was with U.S. playing card? Mm-hmm. What's his name? The guy who owns the U.S. playing card. I don't know. I don't know who owns that. Uh, the one that The General Motors was who? Zumbiel's his son. Oh, Zumbiel? Right. And it was a Zumbiel box company too, wasn't there? Right. Yeah. I didn't realize he owned it. He, he said that at one time he was a, there was a company called Kemper Thomas. Right. And they made pens, but then they switched to making parachutes during World War II. Right. Kemper Thomas? Kemper Thomas. Were they in Norwood? Yes. On Park Avenue, on Park Kemper Thomas. That's good to remember. Um, we don't get that inside details a lot of times. Very important parachute making. What about General Motors? That was in Norway. Do you know what they were doing at all? What they were making during the war? General Motors? At the Fisher body plant that was there? Yeah. Um, that was around in the 40s, right? I think so. I think Fisher Body was up around Hamilton, and, right? And um, Chevrolet manufacturing plant was in Norwood. Okay. Uh, two different. Che okay. Chevrolet was on. Smith. They were on Kemper Top. They were on Park Avenue too, and then they used later on after the war. They'd park their cars as they were being done on the old theater campgrounds off of Reading Road. Was there a lot of rationing going on, like food rationing, sugar, all that kind of thing? Were you guys, was Norwood doing a lot of that? Oh yeah, but not, not too much. Uh, <laughs> people were able to you know what I mean? Fudge a little bit. <laughs> right. Did you get involved, uh, excuse me, did you get involved in any drives where you were collecting old coat hangers and stuff like that and turning them in? No. I guess I was a little bit too young for that. 
Um, I was wondering, they, they would do a lot of that kind of stuff like at the movie theaters there in Norway, wouldn't they? Would yeah. They would do different things. Did you, right. Did you go to the movies much there? They had a couple of theaters there. Oh, three theaters. The uh, Norwood Theater, Park, Parker Plaza, and the old Ohio Theater. They had three theaters at one time. We and and they used they used to do well. Did you go to the movies a lot? Were they doing a lot of like uh, you know news of what's going on in the war and stuff? Oh yeah, you had movie tone news. They'd have fifteen minutes. Uh, showing you what's, what the hell's going on. Was there a roller rink in Norwood? Yes. What was the name of that? Norwood Roller Rink. Norwood Roller Rink. Norwood roller rink. Seferinas. That's Seferinas, wasn't it? What? Uh -huh. no, no, no. Seferinas. Was on Gilbert Avenue. Gilbert or, Avenue. Is that right? Right. I thought so, because that was still around when I was a kid. Yeah. You go there to meet the girls. I was, that was, uh, was a big roller, roller rink. Did you go roller, uh, roller skating as a boy down there in Norwood? Not, not in Norwood. Yeah. Once, once in a while, but it was, it was way down on uh, Sherman Avenue there, and it was damn near uh, on Reading Road. Uh huh. Um, so you were playing baseball in high school. Yes. So you must have been pretty good if you were got, you know, were being recruited. I mean, was your what what position did you play? Shortstop. And how did your team do? I'm assuming this is high school team. I did okay. How tall were you as a st uh, when you went into service? I guess I was about five foot eight. I, I haven't grown much. You picture you look a lot taller. Oh, <laughs> thank you. But you know, there's a there's a tank in Norwood, and it's got my name on it. Oh, is that right? Well, yeah, there was a, <clears throat> I was going to ask whether you were had anything to do. I seen that tank. I drive by it on Montgomery Road, and I was going to ask whether you had anything to do with that. <laughs> it's a it's a Veterans Memorial Park. And they yeah, have bricks. I've, I've been there. Yeah, I bought a brick for him. Oh, no. and had it and put it and put it in there. I think it's a tank that was used in Vietnam. I yeah, it's M60. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, you said you drive a little bit of Sherman tanks and and Sheridan tanks. What, what's the difference between a Sherman tank and a Sheridan? Would you say are the main differences? Not a lot of difference. Just, just a, the Sherman tank. You can maneuver it better, and the Germans could knock the hell out of that other one, real easy, <laughs> real easy. Were you ever hit in your tank by a German? No, thank heavens. That would be almost a death sentence, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, if, if that that tank got hit. You were gone. You were gone. You, my mother would have got a, le a letter and said, sorry. I was going to ask, did, you, did that happen much in your neighborhood where you were living? Were there Gold Star Mothers? Oh, yeah. Reports? Any of your memories about that happening with people in the community? Western Union used to Western Union used to bring the damn letter. Did you know that? Yeah. Western Union used to bring the Gold Star Mother the letter. That was, that was hell. Yeah. Terrible way to do now, 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 of course, if it happens, they send a couple officers. 
But did you know anybody like in school or anybody, a family that was affected that way, who lost people before you went in? I don't think so. Not that I can recall. Um, oh. I had a best friend killed in the Philippines. Well, who was he? Can you tell us a little bit about him? Well, we played sports and ball and everything else. What was his name, do you recall? Joe Martin. Joe Martin. And he, uh, I just missed him in church. On, I have been going to Mass and somebody said, Joe Martin's here. I said, where is he? And I went looking for him, but I didn't find him. And the next thing I heard, he was killed in the Philippines. Was he the same age as you? Ple yes. So uh, when did you find that? Was that, uh, uh, was that before you got drafted he got killed? Or was that oh, no. Or, uh... I got drafted first. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, well, I was wondering when you uh, you went to Scotland and then they transported you to France. Scotland, Southampton, wasn't it? Put next. Well, Scotland uh, went over to went up the, to the hill where that guy with a cognac, but then I. Went to different spots and I ended up with the Fifth Armored Division. What time of year did you arrive in France? Uh, geez. Was I, it already winter? Yes. Too damn cold. Did, did the winter, did that like affect, uh, was it a diesel is, engines, the tanks? Uh, that they were, were really weren't weren't around then. They were uh, just regular engines, huh? Was that so? How much uh, was the winter conditions affecting you driving the, the tanks? I guess you you did snow and ice and things. No, you you would. In fact, the infantry would run behind our tanks and keep their hands warm. Because you had like an exhaust pipe? <laughs> yeah, a couple of exhaust pipes. So how do you, uh, when you're driving a tank, how can you see where you're going? Well, if you've got choices. You can keep your lid open, or you can keep it closed and look through that peephole, and then the tank commander should tell you what the hell's going on? But maybe and maybe not. Um, and I guess it, it, it was pretty loud in there, I would take it. Oh, yeah. How did you guys communicate? Were you able to just do shouting, communicate to each other? Or were there any, did you have any kind of hand signals in case it got too loud? Poor damn leg. Of course, I was I was busy driving a tank, but you uh, you had a little radio, but it didn't work. Didn't work. Well, you talked about how you had a uh, across a bridge on the, using the tank. Did you have to go up a mountain or hills? Was no. it? No. Over had? over. A, over the planks. But I'm just saying in general, did you have to go uh, terrain where you were going uphill and anything like that? Or was it pretty much flat when you were when you were driving the tank? It was different areas. It was one area was a militaristic 
highway, verboten. And some, what the hell were they? They had wagons, wagons in that. And I brought my tank, and I seen that it was Militariski Strasse. I went to the inside. That wagon went to the outside. And the guy said, do you see that? I said, what? That wagon went over the side of the hill. I said, so? We're here. We're here. So you literally drove all the way across France and Germany in a tank. Right. There aren't very many people can say that. No. Thank you. Uh, did you ever see any Russians when you were getting closer into Germany? Any encounters with any Russian soldiers? I think I did. But they were, they were creepy looking. Creepy looking. <laughs> Do you remember where you were when you heard the war was over in Europe? I was in a, I think I was in that at Blyther Rota. Blyther Rota? That would have been May the 8th of right. 45 at Blyther Rota. Did you uh, run into any, any uh, officers, like anybody, like a big brass people, like Patton or anybody like that? Did you ever come across anybody like that? Oh, no. Patton wouldn't care for guys like me. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't care for anybody. No. And when were you over there, was there any opportunity for entertainment? Like, was there a USO show or anything like that that you ever got to see? or were you uh, When I was coming down through Marseille, I think Bob Hope came through there, but I never went to see him. Somebody said, aren't you going to see him? I said, I don't care. I want to see that ship. <laughs> You're very focused. Right. <laughs> um, how long were you over in Europe before you got back to Newport News, to Virginia? How long was the time from the war ended to when you actually got transported back to, to the United States? I guess about a year, but I don't know. And uh, did you get to see much of the, I mean, obviously, I mean, you were there for service, but I was wondering what other, did you get to see any, what other cities you saw in Germany or in France, like well, after the war was over? Well, Marseille, as far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> did you get any, did you go into town or anything like that to any of the uh, pubs or anything like no. that in France? No. All I want to do is out. Out, out, out. Give me a, put me on that boat. Well, I have another question. When you were traveling by tank and you would stay over, where would you sleep? Would you sleep on top of your tank or did you camp out or? Where were you, would you find a place like in, in a village or something to sleep at? Oh yeah, there were plenty of places. Did you sleep like in a loft at, at one point or something? Wherever we could find a place to sleep. You told me you slept under your tank a lot. Right.
So there were like five guys to assign to a tank. Mm -hmm. So what were the what were their assignments? What were a typical tank crew? But five guys would be to a tank. A gunner, a loader, commander, assistant driver, and the driver. What would the assistant driver do? Is he like the navigator? Sit over there, <laughs> and he had a thirty caliber machine gun. I think you mentioned about your hearing. Did you have hearing issues with your ears? You were saying after you came back from service that they looked at your ears and they said, "Right, you know, what was wrong with your ears?" Couldn't hear from them. Was that even they, was that even before you went into service? You thought? Yes. Because I would think being in that tank would have made it even worse. It did. I guess you never. I guess you never bothered with anything with the VA, with the veterans. Uh, I have went to the VA, and they have taken care of it. Now he does regularly. Oh, good. Now he's what? He does regularly now. Like good. his hearing aids are from the VA. Good. His glasses are from the VA. Yeah. Excellent. And they treat him wonderful. Yeah, yeah. they're they're really good. I yeah. take him over occasionally. Where, where do you guys take them? Where do you uh, go for VA? There's a Florence location up here, uh, right off Turfway Road, mm -hmm. and that's where they do the hearing tests, and and, and they're so nice, super nice, and um, and then the one over in uh, near UC, <coughs> not in the VA hospital. Well, we go there sometimes, but then there's another place right up the street. I can't remember what street it's on, but um, that's where he has his eyes checked, and they also do hearing checks there, and and they're really good too. That's good to hear. Yeah. Well, I already had like one or two more questions, but one of the questions I want to ask is, I understand that you did honor flight. Yes. Pictures right behind you. So how did they, how did they find you? <laughs> when, did, when did you go? How, how did, did that we, come about? You put that in, Bill. Um, I think, Mo, you ran into somebody, didn't you, or talked to somebody about it? And then and they asked about Bob. Yeah, we went to a veteran's breakfast Yeah. For lunch, it was. You said St. Elizabeth sponsored it. Yeah, and, and so they said, they didn't, never knew him or anything like that, but since he was a World War II veteran at his age, they asked us to get him on a flight as soon as possible. So we, uh, we put in all the paperwork, and within a couple months, he was on flight. So when, when did you go on honor flight? What year? About four years ago, wasn't yeah, it, Bill? It was a few years. I don't remember exactly when. No. I have a bunch of pictures of it that I took and um, videos. It was really nice. Was there anything on that trip that you remember, Bob, that you found, in, you know, a moment that you remember from that honor flight thing? Well, it stays with you. They, they sprayed the plane as it left. But also, when we got off, the people waiting to get on the, 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 the next flight, they applauded us. And I've, I have never forgotten that. Well, that's really the only thing I, I, I wanted to ask. So thank you. A band was playing mm -hmm. in the Washington, D.C. airport. <coughs> Well, they did the honor spray over the plane on the way out and on the way back. Oh, the when, we land, when we left Cincinnati, yeah. they sprayed across the plane right. with the fire departments as the plane taxied out. There were flags lined all up in the plane, in the, in the uh, area where all the passengers were. There were flags on every single seat, the, uh, or the overhead. And um, the, there were flags all the way up the walkway in the Washington, D.C. airport. There was a band playing, and hundreds of people cheering them on as they came out of the, yeah. as, as I pushed him up out there. And then uh, it was amazing because every time we went to a different location in Washington, D.C., high school kids were walking up and shaking their hands, thanking them for their service. Yeah. And that's unusual nowadays. It seems right. Like, you know, and then on the way back, you know, on the way back, it, 
we got to the airport in Washington, D.C. and took a giant picture of everybody. Uh, and it was pen. amazing because the police, the police lady, I think she was on a motorcycle. Thank you. She wore an outfit like Rosie the Riveter with her gun strapped to her leg. <laughs> and we had three buses. We got on the interstate. She stopped her motorcycle in the middle of the interstate and stuck her hand out, and that interstate stopped. That's right. And then the buses went. And then she caught up to us, and when we got stuck in traffic, she stopped all of the oncoming traffic going at us, and we went in to all the opposite direction, all through the streets of Washington, D.C., to avoid the traffic until we got to the locations. She was amazing. But, yeah, it was good. Um, I just had one more question I, I, I just wanted to ask earlier, but you, you landed at Omaha Beach? Yes. And so that was after the D-Day. Oh yeah. After, but was what was? What, do you remember much? Was there much uh, uh, damage? Things like that. Uh, what do you remember when you got to that beach? What What do you just, remember was still there? Just regular, right? regular damage. Yeah. Tell me about the churches. The churches on D-Day. The what? The churches on D-Day. Churches. You said every church. Was filled to capacity. Oh, on D Day, every church in Norwood, we found out, no matter what their denomination was, it was filled to capacity. Every church. And that was amazing. What church did you go to in Norwood? St. Matthew's. St. Matthew's. I visited France a few years ago and visited North, uh, Omaha Beach. And I brought back Sam's from Omaha Beach for him. And that's on top of the mantle over there. Mm -hmm. No more questions? I, I want to... Uh, Take this time, what? And just uh, as a, a son of a World War II veteran, right? And a, and a grandson of a World War II veteran, right? I want to thank you for your service to our country, and your wonderful life that you've given our country. Thank you. Thank you, sir.